You're tuned in to RX Radio. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of RX Radio. I feel like I'm deposing myself. The whole light camera situation going on here. So, uh, yeah, first off, uh, thanks for all the love. Lundy's been hitting us with the numbers lately, and I, we don't know why. And maybe it's a glitch, or maybe I'm getting hyped for no reason. But uh, downloads have been up like crazy, so appreciate you guys sharing it. If you haven't, hit the actual subscribe button on the things that you listen to podcasts on. So if you listen on Spotify, just hit subscribe. If you hit it, well, listen on iTunes, hit subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe. Uh, but yeah, appreciate the love. It's just really cool to see the numbers kind of jump up. Um, but yeah, today's episode, me and Jay back in the studio talking about exercise programming, um, really kind of laying out a framework of how it is that we started our exercise programming journey and kind of really some of the I don't want to say sophisticated, but like some of the things that we get away from an exercise programming that I think we should return back to, like it's getting crazy out there. Like the exercise programming world is so 4D chess, which is look, there's a time and a place for that. But it's like your gem pop clients. They just want to like smack the kids in the back seat without fucking blowing a rib out. We don't need to be doing all this crazy shit. Like getting back to the simple, sophisticated stuff, I think is, is a lot of the fun and in exercise programming, getting people stronger, knowing when what matters is supposed to matter, I think is a huge, uh, a huge criteria that we need to fulfill as as coaches. Now that being said, and actually like probably one of the only good segues I've ever had in trying to pay the fucking bills, skill acquisition is a lot. I've learned so much from Killian Hamilton when it comes to exercise programming and really this distilled essence that is exercise programming and his skill acquisition model that he teaches uh, in prescript skill acquisition is is such a uh it's it's such a a meta way of looking at exercise programming that simplifies the hell out of your process whether you're an athlete whether you're a coach whether you're a trainer looking to just gain a little bit more insight on how to effectively program for exercises have your clients acquire the skills necessary that they can take with them for the rest of their lives to know how to exercise and know how to program themselves great course up live on the prescript site um so do check that out. Gillian's actually going to be doing my programming. So for those of you who are uh, interested in training along with me, found a cool gym out here in Dubai. So I'm going to start actually recording my workouts and Gillian's going to be doing my exercise programming. Um, so if you guys want to follow along and train with me and we can talk through why we're picking the exercise we're doing and the volume, the intensities and how to adjust for like, your gym, or your scenario. Um, do join us on the Prescript Collective. So you're going to get all my exercise programming uh, for free as a part of the collective with the Emerging Ideas Lecture Share Series, which is two keynote speakers a month, which has been amazingly uh, insightful, even for me to be able to review some of this content. It's been awesome. Uh, our technique labs, which are run twice a week, which are a lot of fun being able to like dissect and discern different progressions and regressions in the way clients are, are presenting with their um, movements in there, whether it's compound lifts or whether it's isolation, whether it's printing, we have such a resource of coaches. It's amazing. Um, the forum has been great. The, the chats are always 24 seven worldwide. Every country imaginable is represented here. So, you know, people are throwing up videos of their training. People are asking questions about organization. People are talking about networking and podcasts and all that stuff. So, um, and then with that, as well as now my exercise programming going in there uh, for 35 a month, kind of a no brainer. I subscribe to it and I own the damn company with Jay. So it's definitely something that I've found a tremendous amount of value and hopefully you guys will do the same. So prescript skill acquisition up on the website now, uh, banger of a course starts in April. Killian does an absolute hell of a job in studio with Lundy, no less. So if you guys are used to the production quality of the courses, um, hell of a lot of fun when the courses can be done inside the studio. So that just mixed with the content and mixed with Killian, mixed with sort of the real life application of this model. Wicked, wicked course. Get on that. Payment plans available. Collective. You guys don't want to go head first into the deep end and give us nine weeks of your time. Totally cool with that. But if you guys want to hang out with the RX radio crew, just talk a little bit more about training, get a little bit more out of your training, follow along with my training. Uh, you can do that as well on the Prescript Collective. It's just 35 a month, um, direct access to us um, and all the Prescript crew, Vigera, Baxter, Thayer, Mac, uh, Stu, Killian, me, Jay, uh, hell of a lot of fun. So this episode of Exercise Programming, guys, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, if you have any questions, 
do let us know. Hit us up on the collective if you feel free to join us. Um, and also, uh, you know, keep a, keep an eye out for some big announcements next week. Hit the subscribe button, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and so forth. And thanks for your time, guys. We'll catch you next week. Oh, it, it just it gets me every time. I wish I had that before I entered every room I went into. It was oh. just like a little countdown, like it just <laughs> three, two, one, huzzah! Like coming like Kramer, and just just makes it just I don't know. It makes me smile. Um, do you remember the first program you ever wrote? Um, like for yourself, like not for other people. Yeah, I'd have to think back to like. My, I'm hesitant to say this. My bodybuilding body days. Oh, yeah. so good. <laughs> oh, we got to find that picture. Lonnie, put it up. Oh, uh, don't put it up, please. Um, yeah, and it was more so like Monday, chest and tries. Tuesday, legs. Wednesday, back and buys. So it was Thursday. just the framework? Like it wasn't even like exercises? Like you're, you started off like, I'm just going to do this on this day. And this yeah. thought process is me thinking about my training. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think we've said it many a times before people do a lot of dumb shit and still get strong or still get progress. And that's exactly how I started out. Like my, my weightlifting, bodybuilding in the gym career is just doing literally everything I could and then continuing to do that until t today. No. Today? What's today? Yeah, today. So it's today. been 15 yeah. years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, th the interesting thing is there's there's actually like, to me, there's an elegance to that that uh, sometimes gets lost where it's, you know, that signals to me when people at least start that, that like, okay, you're understanding some like local fatigue interference between like concurrently training muscle groups and their roles from a primary and secondary tertiary, right. like right, right, right. probably didn't have back near leg day. You probably didn't have shoulders and triceps near chest day. Like that was, yeah. and moving those pawns around the board was like, you know, that was like the queen's game. Like you were sitting there just like the most you know the most prolific exercise programmer going like see what i did there <laughs> yeah you know i did biceps yeah. and hamstrings and it's like oh, whoa cool. look out you must have read last month's muscular development but honestly like <laughs> exactly i look at some people's programming and it's always hard to look at programming because you know it's there's so it's so contextual to where people have been where they want to go limitations in equipment limitations in ability pain all of these different constraints but you look at some people's program and it's almost as if the smarter they get, they lose that really elegant principle sometimes. And it's like the interference just runs rampant. And it's almost like they've read too many books that they actually forgot about that. Like, you know, eight and a half by 11 college ruled sheet of paper. That was like, look at my exercise program. It's yeah. like, you had to write it down. Like you hold on. You actually, <laughs> you couldn't remember in your fucking brain that like Tuesday was chest and triceps day. But <laughs> I don't know. There's, but I think it's a really good jumping off point, right? And because there is, and I always think there's a benefit to it, but I think there's a lot of people who want to be coaches. And the first client that you have is you, right? Yeah. And I know, I know people without a doubt that program for people that have never programmed for themselves, <laughs> right? And it's like one thing to program workouts that you'd never do. Cause like, I don't know, I'm not a fucking. I'm not a 800 meter runner, but it's like, I understand energy systems. I understand I could program for one, but right. it's another thing entirely to never have executed a program that you've written, right? Like there's an intangible, uh, flow to exercise that you can really pick up. Who's, who's actually programmed for themselves and who's just like done a, you know, today feels like I'm going to do this day. And then they try to write some elaborate program. So it's, it's, it's always a question that I get posed and I'm always interested in your answer is like, you know, how do you start programming for yourself? How do you break free from a coach or how do you break free of yourself to become a coach and actually write your own program? Like that's obviously where you started. But if you were to give advice of like a step-by-step -step process of like how to write your own exercise program, where would you start? Yeah, it's funny because it's almost like uh, backwards the way that I would approach this is I would get coached first, hmm. right? I would I would get some sort of baseline level of, okay, this is common practice. Um, 
I've worked with, I've done like remote programming. I've worked with different coaches in person, um, remote, whatever it is. And I've seen, you know, a variety of different programs or different intentions. And you see kind of common things that, that run a vein of, of commonality between these different programs. Even, you know, I've done strength and conditioning for wrestling. I've done, um, you know, bodybuilding training, we'll call it. I've done um, CrossFit competitively. I've done weightlifting as a sport competitively. And a lot of the things that you notice is is there's going to be an order to the programming, right? Generally, it's going to be the important shit you do first, right? You get ready, you prepare, you do the important shit, and then you do the stuff that supports the important shit afterwards. If you were to boil down a program into, you know, as simple as it could be. So a big thing is just don't complicate it, right? Figure out what's important, figure out what's going to drive you towards the goal or what sort of adaptation you're trying to make. And then from there, you can start to fill in the gaps is that if I want to prioritize leg strength, then I'm probably going to squat and do things that support squatting. And I'm going to do that at a higher frequency, uh, maybe a higher volume at first, funneling down to a lower volume and a higher intensity over time. And then the things that I do around that are going to support ancillary goals or secondary goals that are outside of that. So if I were to relate that back to like weightlifting, you know, you to be a good weightlifter, you need strong legs. There's not a good weightlifter that doesn't have strong legs. So I'd say leg strength is pretty important. For a novice lifter, you can check a lot of boxes all at once by building leg strength and working with a very light barbell in between. So if I want to get good at snatch and clean and jerk, a lot of times that first priority can be leg strength, right? I'm going to squat. I'm going to squat often. I'm going to get really good at first the skill of squatting. So maybe higher volume, lower intensity, higher frequency. And then, and I'll kind of expand on some of these ideas in just a minute. But as you're accumulating a lot of fatigue in squatting, because of that higher volume, higher frequency, um, then what's going to happen is you're not going to have as much of a physical capacity to train on other days. So what you can do is have more of maybe a neurological emphasis in training on those other days where you're working with an empty barbell or a very light barbell working on snatch positions, or you're working on increasing overhead stability, or you're working on hip stability, or things like that that are going to help lend towards the ending goal of um, having a better snatch and a better clean and jerk over time. But that's what it looks like right now. And kind of what I got ahead of myself in saying is that what are your variables to play with with programming, right? It's volume, it's intensity, it's reps, it's sets, it's frequency, it's exercise selection. It's no more complicated than that, right? And I think a lot of times people try to complicate it and they try to make it that, no, I know better because I do this or I do that. It's that's all it really boils down to. So when you look at a program, you can you can look at these variables and see if it makes sense or see if it doesn't. Nothing pisses me off like people have prescribed seven reps. <laughs> Nothing, like literally, I don't know of a thing in the last like <laughs> week that has pissed me off more than seeing a program that's prescribed seven reps. It's like you had to you had to go with the odd number just to be different. <laughs> like you fuck. Six to eight is a way smarter exercise designation than seven reps because they're like what seven reps what an ugly number and it's but that's literally what it is right like you said it doesn't have to be more complicated than that and each one of those variables like the first one that came to mind that gets just blown out of proportion is exercise selection it's like you know we see so many inefficient exercises because like let's say there's certain positions there's certain movements there's certain muscles there's certain desired outcomes right whether it's strength of a muscle whether it's strength of a, or uh, like stiffness of a tendon whether it's uh you know aerobic capacity whether it's um i don't know a muscle hypertrophy like all of these things are going to pretty much encompass the majority of outcomes that you're looking for and that you can actually derive from weight training right like what's the what's the best exercise for fat loss is like, is that's a stupid question, right? That's not an exercise. That's not an exercise selection. Uh, that's not, a, that's not a point that exercise selection can really touch. So it's really, you have, you have strength outcomes, you have hypertrophy outcomes. You might have some sort of expenditure outcome, like a caloric expenditure outcome. You have something maybe testing like, uh, the aerobic system 
And then you could, if you're in a more sports specific domain, you probably have some outcome that looks like uh, tendon stiffness, ground contact time, speed, or velocity. It's like, that's really it. Now, if you break all of those down, there's only a few, or there is, I think just one or two tools per each one of those category that are ultimately going to be effective, yeah. right? Like, and this is, you know, an easy bone to pick with like early days CrossFit programming, let's say, or let's just say less diligent CrossFit programming, because there are gyms that do it right and there are coaches that do it smart, but it's like building conditioning with a barbell. Like you don't see me going in with a Concept 2 rower and putting it on my back and squatting it because a Concept 2 rower is a shitty implement to build strength just as a barbell is a shitty implement to build conditioning, right? Like what are the bottlenecks to each one of the implements that we have at our disposal and what is going to be the energy system shape or position that ultimately bottlenecks us when using that tool? Barbells are really good tools to get strong, right? Fan bikes or assault bikes and Concept 2 rowers are really good at testing the aerobic system. System, right field work track jumping plyometrics are probably going to be something that's better uh, suited for like a tendon stiffness adaptation so that immediately it's like it boils it down into this programming mad lib that if you understand how to designate uh like a search criteria or exclusion criteria for each one of these variables programming is just like you're basically left with a few exercises Right. If you ask the right questions, it's I always compare it to like picking an Airbnb, something I've done a bajillion fucking times. And probably honestly to this day, one of the only people that's been deplatformed off of Airbnb. <laughs> Shout out the only person who's ever had their Airbnb. I love to account. When you book an Airbnb and it's under Louise Shallow. Louise Shallow. I got a burner <laughs> Airbnb account because they legitimately can't. They're like, and they said you and I've tried to sign up with mine. I'm like, there's no way this company is like. No, I tried to sign up again and they, they canceled it right away. Wow. Yeah. You know what? Fuck Airbnb owners, man. Like I pay a cleaning fee and they still like, well, the counter was dirty. Fuck this guy's like, it's like, you don't get to judge me and take my money. You can do one of both, but you can't do, or you can do either or you can't do both. Yeah. You can't yeah, judge I me and that. take my money. It's like, I literally had this, this bitch. In Australia, oh, this is podcast over. We're just going to talk about Airbnbs. I had this Airbnb in Kingscliff, Australia. Maybe it was, oh, no, Coffs Harbor, Coffs Harbor. Middle of nowhere fucking town. You can get a mansion on a hill for like 70 bucks a night. So I got a seven bedroom house because one bed to sleep in and six beds to jump on. <laughs> Why and the fuck not? All I did was I put my suitcase on one of the beds in the other room. And then I got this lengthy defaming review about how I had other people staying. Cause I was just like, yeah, it was just two people staying there. And they're like, no, it wasn't. The other bed was messy. It was like, what are you fucking Joe? Anyways, I'm not going to, cause I'll lose it. But I am the Alex Jones of Airbnb. I've been completely deplatformed and I'm now under the alias of Louise shallow. Every time I book, <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. Booking Airbnbs, which I still do by the way. So fuck you, Airbnb. Uh, you have all this filter criteria, like we're going out to California. So when I go to California, it's like, well, I know the relative neighborhood I want to go. That's my big rock. Right? That's my goal. That's my destination. Right. So it's like, are you, is your goal building strength? Right. Is your goal, uh, building speed is your goal building? You know, what is the important shit? The important shit is that I'm not in Oakland when I need to be in Santa Clara. That's real important. So that first that's my first search criteria that I filter. And that's literally how you navigate the website. You go there, where would you like to go? Is the question they ask. Like, I would like to go close to this guy. I'd like to be as close to Junta as I can. Appreciate and then that. immediately it goes from, you know, 300 plus searches down. Oh, in your neighborhood, it's probably still 300 plus, but it whittles out a lot of the noise. It doesn't show me anything from Oakland. It doesn't show me anything from the, you know, fucking tenderloin district in San Francisco. It just shows me shit near Santa Clara. So it's right. like, if someone comes to me, it's like, I want to get strong. It's like, I'm immediately starting to push some of these things to my periphery, right? Some of these other adaptations and with these adaptations attached to them are exercises that I'm likely just not going to see rep ranges that I'm likely not going to see. Right? So as I filter more, it's like, well, when would you like to go? Fair question. How, how strong do you want to get into a certain time? And then Airbnb filters it out. But then you'd still be left with, like if you're in Toronto, if you're in the Bay Area, you're still left with like an insurmountable amount of different places. So that you, you filter about more. And it's like, all right, well, you know, I need Wi-Fi. 
I fucking need air conditioning regardless of the season. So Wi-Fi air conditioning, and then you lose a few. It's like, okay, well, this person has uh, a rotator cuff injury and they're just coming off of a season. It's like, okay, this is starting to whittle down. We're probably going to remove these exercises and these relative intensities early. We're probably going to include these other exercises. And then if you keep going, it's like really by the time I pick an Airbnb, there's seven left. Right? I want washer, I want dryer. If I'm in San Francisco, I'm probably going to get something dog friendly. I want uh, Wi Fi. I want a kitchen. I want it close to a gym or a coffee shop or something like that. If I'm renting a car, I'll probably want parking on premises. And then, sure enough, if I go through all that, boom, it gives me seven left. And that's really exercise programming to me is like understand the, f- the filtering criteria. Like Airbnb doesn't ask me, uh, what color do you want the walls? Like, I don't give a fuck. Right? But coaches have these questions, right? Coaches have these questions that they ask their clients that do not change the outcome of their program at all. And if it does, their program's dog shit. Like I always think of one of the rules that we learned in Cairo school was about uh, advanced imaging. And it's something that I probably cite on a weekly basis. Like imaging, like when you ask for like an x-ray or an MRI is a question. And there are certain questions like, I don't know, what, or what do you like in the morning? What am I like in the what morning? What are you like in the morning? I'm I'm are you trash talking until in I the get, morning? No, fuck no. Don't talk okay. to me until I have two cups of coffee. But does is it does Fran know that? It's, yes. Is I she wake the up same, before though? I wake up before her just to make sure this isn't in. Dude, issue. I'm the same. I wake up at four thirty because I'm I have to be an asshole for three hours and I want to be in a healthy relationship. Yeah. So absolutely. I can just wake up and be like, oh god, fuck and then like at eight thirty it's like, Oh hi, good morning, how are you? Yeah. Like I've just been cursing the world for literally three hours. I hate, like, you ever go home and visit your parents? Yeah. And your parents just don't give a fuck about your little three-hour <laughs> rule. And, like, the first thing out of bed, it's just 21 questions. And yeah. none of the answers matter. How did you sleep? It, uh, what? I haven't slept since before grad school. Like, can you leave me alone, please? What are you going to do today? It's like, oh, I'm going to stay in a fucking hotel, apparently. Like, I'm getting out of my face right now. <laughs> and it's like, I don't like questions that the answers don't matter right like i think that's so fair and i the first that was first indoctrinated into us with like hey don't order x-rays or mris if the outcome of that doesn't matter essentially ask your patients like look if this comes back as like a disc herniation would you get surgery it's like fuck no it's like then fuck no to the thing let's just assume it is not do this whole schrodinger's cat bullshit and let's just treat the way you feel and there's obvious like exclusion criteria to that with based off of age and pre-existing condition family history all that but when we think about designing these exclusion criteria these filtering criteria for exercise around our clients programming Think of your, does this question's potential answer change my thought process? And like immediately you're just left with like a consolidated amount of questions that give you a consolidated a number of answers that then consolidate your exercise selection really. And that's one of the biggest things and not even exercise selection, exercise selection, overall volume, density, relative intensity. It's like all of these things can be curated 12 questions or less. Right. And I'm seeing intake forms that are like seven miles long. It's like a, like a Best Buy receipt at Christmas. It's like I could encompass the world of the equator with three Best Buy receipts. Like, why does it have to be this long with the survey at the bottom? It's like, why are patient or why are client intake forms so long? Because they're asking questions that either A, don't matter, or B, they think they matter and are making decisions based off of these questions that they think matter, but don't. Yeah, absolutely. <sighs> <laughs> Airbnb thing got me a little fired up there, man. It brought oh. back some like really hard memories. I, yeah, I can tell. Yeah, well, dude, that's, that's right. like, I'll... that was my home for three years was that app. So it was like being told over an email. Like it was like getting evicted. Yeah. I was dry. I remember the day I was driving to Fortis with Killian and I was got this email. Like we've reviewed your account and no, we're shutting <laughs> it down. And it was like, no questions asked, no appeal process, not called them. And they're like, oh, you're Jordan click. I was like, oh, <laughs> We're going to gangster on me like that. Straight up blacklisted, dude. Actually, yeah. They named names. It's ridiculous. But yeah, like that to me is how I look at exercise programming. It's just, it's a Boolean operator of search criteria. Absolutely. And the thing that I think understanding for me that simplified exercise programming, because I told you how I started running my head through the fucking wall every single day. And some days I could run through more walls than others. And some days I couldn't run through that many walls. And you know what the smart person name for that is? The SRA curve. 
stress was it response stress recovery adaptation right stress recovery like adaptation yeah that's yeah, that's stress exactly recovery, it. stress response or something like that response adaptation right so if you know in short in in words it's basically a graphical representation of once you introduce a train a stimulus stimulus is what the s is a training Good stimulus word. what's going to happen is your performance is going to go down so if i do a back squat session of any sort of meaningful intensity and my goal is getting stronger what's going to happen is immediately following that back squat session i'm going to be worse at back squatting i can't back squat uh you know max reps at 80 percent and then go ahead and do more reps three hours later. It's just not possible, right? So what's going to happen is performance is going to decrease, and, and your body is going to see that stress, and it's going to adapt to that stress if you give it the proper environment to do so, right? And that's, you know, proper nutrition. If you have the amount of calories, protein, whatever you need to recover, rebuild from that. If you have the proper sleep, um, hydration, you know, stress is always a factor too. But as that, as you get further away from that stimulus, what's going to happen is you're not, the fatigue is going to dissipate. It's going to go away over time and you're going to adapt to a place where you can now perform at a higher level. And that adaptation is going to be available for a certain amount of time. After, you know, if you don't introduce another stimulus in that amount of time, you're eventually going to lose the training adaptation from that first session. Right. So it's, you know, an easy way to put this is if we just think of a calendar week, if I squat on Monday, maybe Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm going to be dog shit. Right. I'm not going to be able to have any sort of meaningful loading. Um, it's not going to be a good time for me to try and do that, because what I'm doing is when I'm in a, a period of lower performance, I'm trying to stress myself again. And instead of having that time where I can go through and recover and adapt from that first stimulus, I'm actually fatiguing myself more each time. So I'm never getting to a place of favorable adaptation because after, you know, this initial training stress, I'm just staying stressed out, stressed out, stressed out, and not allowing myself to adapt because I don't have the available resources to fully recover from that initial stressor. Now, so, would you say that's a unique thing to you because of the level you're at? Because like, yeah, if you squat, it will trash you because you can take the squat and trash yourself with it. But like if you're Absolutely. a if you're a novice, you get like can you in your mind are they trash for 72 hours? So <laughs> that's funny that you said 72 hours and you brought up muscle development earlier because that's exactly how I exactly how I regimen my training sessions. I read some articles like it's not beneficial to train any less than 72 hours apart because your muscles won't grow or some shit. I'm like, okay, every three days. All right, that's how I do this forever yeah. now. Yeah, exactly. But um, yes, yeah, so that's very skill dependent. It's very um, person dependent too. It's like you can take a squat to the house and maybe be trashed for two weeks and I can do it and maybe be trashed for three days because that absolute load is going to be so much less than what I'm moving compared to what you're moving, right? And that's going to be different from, you know, there's going to be a ton of variables. All the, the things you want to take into account when programming is like gender, age, weight, training experience, skill level, prior training experience, prior injuries. Um, I'm trying to think any more off the top of my head, but th they're going to be a lot of the, like like you said, the big rocks, the, the filter criteria is like, Typically, you know, to generalize, a lighter, smaller female is going to be able to handle volume better than a larger, heavier male, right? And a lot of times that comes back to, to absolute load, right? If, you know, a, a 200-pound squat is going to have a lot less of an impact on someone's nervous system, regardless of the person, than an 800-pound squat, right? So, so that absolute load is going to have a huge impact on um, training frequency, you can't squat 800 pounds and then be good to go again on Wednesday. On mon Squat on Monday, be good to go again on Wednesday, right? If I were to try and squat 800 pounds, I would never be good to go again. <laughs> I would just be fucking good dead. Good to go to the hospital. <laughs> exactly. So so in, in starting to understand that like SRA, that, that stress... Stimulus, response, adaptation, stress, response, adaptation. Stimulus, response, stress, adaptation. Response, adaptation. Exactly, adaptation. exactly. Know, it's all the different. SRA curve was like the big kind of kind of shifting in my mindset that is it's not about going hard all the time it's about stressing yourself and giving yourself the proper time to have a favorable adaptation and then stressing yourself again at the right time to continue that trend upward 
over time. Because if you, you know, if you look at the summation of these waves over time, it's, it doesn't matter from week to week. It doesn't matter from day to day. It matters from year to year. If that trend is, you know, the degree of the angle or the slope of that line, the steeper that is, that means that you're going to get much stronger over your lifetime versus if someone's just kind of maintaining baseline. A plateau is not giving a fuck about progress. It's, y it's equals nothing M more than that. Plus math. <laughs> Man, he just went for it. Slope <laughs> of the line. Jesus. Uh, All right, so let's turn over the big rocks. Because you, it's funny because you listed seven things, and then like those are kind of like the big seven things, like the filtering criteria. So I think for me, obviously, like what do you want to do? How good are you? Or are you at it right now? Right? Like you want to get stronger? Well, how strong are you? You want to get fast? Well, how fast are you? Right. Yeah. Time dependency is always going to be a big, both in a macro and a micro, right? So like macro is like, well, when do you want to be X fast or when do you want to be X strong? Uh, that'll take into consideration, you know, different extraneous variables that we can weave in to maybe set up a, a broader base if we have a longer time period or if it's like, look, we got a season in eight weeks. There are things that we just have to jettison because we need to just, you know, there are small rocks that are never going to get turned over and this is what we need to do to get you where you need to be. Um, but also time from like a more micro perspective is something that uh, oftentimes in general population training is going to be one of your bigger constraints that's going to prioritize some of the other questions or the efficacy or the importance of some of the other questions you ask, right? Like if I'm trying to parse out I don't know, 16 to 24 different exercises per like uh, mesocycle, but someone only has the ability to train three days a week. It's like, that is a huge constraint, right? That's a huge, uh, or that's a very narrow geographical window that I need to look for. That's like finding an Airbnb within a four street radius. It's like, look, you're just going to kind of have to put up with what you get here, right? Like, oh, you wanted a bungalow with a detached garage. It's like, they only got raised ranches. Because this is the superimposing or the the preeminent factor that'll drive a lot. So when you're writing an exercise program, one of the early questions that I think you should ask is based around time. Obviously, like from a macro perspective, when do you want to achieve said goal? But also from a micro perspective, how many days a week can you train? And then how many days a week or how long during those sessions can you? By the time you ask that, the next couple of questions, if we already know the goal, we have some idea of their current state, we have some idea of the constraint both in a macro perspective and a micro perspective of time, get some things around past history, injury, uh, or sorry, past history of injury, maybe a little bit about um, training age, gender, absolute strength. And it's like, we're pretty much there. Right. Like, because I think those bottlenecks of those early questions that you ask are going to start to raise to the top very quickly exercises that are just honestly the most effective means of achieving whatever that desired end goal is. And here I think is the biggest takeaway for coaches is that some people have the dumbest goals ever. <laughs> and you need to be able to tell, like, I've had people be like, I want to fit in to this dress in four months. It's like, I suggest you find a new husband. This is gonna take a while. Like, this is not, <laughs> sorry, sweetheart. Like, this is not gonna happen, right? Like, cause I think people, and one of the disservices you can do is be like a coddling yes men and be like, oh yeah, no, we can do it. And then next thing you know, like, here comes the bride busting at the seams. It's like, look, you're doing this girl a disservice, right? So I think that's something that we need to be very comfortable with. And really the only way this model of, of very efficient, effective exercise programming can be viable is if you know the outer limits of like human adaptation, right? Like I have this many weeks to do this. It's like, uh, that's probably can't be done, right? Like unless you just want to go on a trend banger and like just like dose your kidneys into oblivion. It's like you probably can't do that. I want to lose 90 pounds in four weeks all right, go find someone else or go find, this isn't, oh, you thought this was the place where they staple your stomach? No, this is where, this is the gym. That's not the place where that happens, right? And I think a lot of coaches are so, you know, they're just, yes, they're like, yeah, oh, no, yeah, no, we can totally, it's like, hey, no, no, you totally can't fucking do that, right? Like, I don't know, what are you looking at? Maybe a kilo a week in early stages if you're lucky, right? one to 2.2 pounds a week in weight loss. And depending on like your dietary approach, maybe a little bit more, but it's going to taper off long-term. Like if you pull some keto bullshit or you cut carbs out, yeah, you might see a drop. 
depending on the starting body weight. Yeah, you might see a drop, but really over the course of, you know, six months, it's all going to come out in the wash, right? Like it's going to average out to probably if you're diligent and, and consistent one to two and a half pounds a week. And if you drop more than that, be a little bit concerned because your boy's got a tapeworm. Like you probably shouldn't be looking for these like really stark drops in body weight if that's the goal. And the same is you probably shouldn't be looking for these crazy stark increases in strength either, right? Like if someone goes from like benching 225 and then three weeks later benching 315, it's like, what have you been, whose medicine cabinet have you been getting into? You know what I mean? Like be very... I don't want to say concern, but like if someone goes from 225 to 315, it's like, yo, you were sandbagging it for the 225 of your bench at 315 or trend banger, right? Like this really <laughs> like understand physiological normal ranges, right? Because it's like you don't want to – and the worst thing you want to do from a business perspective is overpromise and underdeliver, right? Like, oh, hey, half pound a week. It's like, oh, I'm down, I'm down a pound and a half. It's like, yeah, fucking right. If you say 2.2 and they come in like, hey, I'm only down a pound. That's a totally different perspective of like glass half empty, glass half full, right? So it's like, you know, undershoot always. Like, yeah, you know, maybe we put 10 pounds on your bench this cycle. Hey, we put like 30 pounds on the bench in like eight weeks. It's like sick. But if you only, if you say 10 and they only put on five, it's like, mm. you know what I mean? There's a psychology to it that that's going to allow you to really be able to capture the one thing that matters most. And you alluded to it with the idea of the, the summation of all of these adaptations is consistency, right? So we can ask all these questions and we can organize these programs in a logical manner, but we need to understand like the psychology behind how we're framing all this that can just keep them coming back. Or, you know, maybe it's not coming back to us as coaches, but at least keep them training really is what you want to do. Because I think just as many people get bored of training, then get hurt from training, right? Then get, then plateau from training. A lot of times the plateaus is people's interest, right? Really at the, at the level of general population, gen pop people can't hurt themselves, right? And like, like, don't get me wrong. They can hurt themselves, but it's like, I've been hurt from lifting weights. Right, I tore my quad at the second rep of a 661 squat and thought, thank you, sir, may I have another? And just went down one more time just to make sure that it was really fucked. Or like, gen pop people can't do that, right? Like, it's just not, the, literally, there's a, like a, there's a reflex arc of the Golgi tendon organ and muscle spindle that you need to consciously, in, like, almost say this out loud so your brain hears it, goes, shut the fuck up, brain. I'm going to do it anyways. Like, and normal people, thank God, don't have that. So it's like, I don't even know what the fuck I was talking about, but basically it's <laughs> most people, the psychological component of training, most right, people right. are going to drop off because they plateau in interest, right? Not because they plateau in an ability to overcome, right? So it's like yeah. understanding that element as a coach, I think is really important. Um, but, you know, equally so is like that comes after. That comes after like this general framework of exclusion criteria of like, okay, like let's do this from the top. What is the goal, right? What energy system are we really, and like you know, sometimes you got to translate it, right? And some people yeah. have ridiculous goals that don't go, I want to get big and strong and lean and run a marathon. It's like, all right, Superman, yeah. you, uh, you let me know how that goes. It's just like, you got to pick one, right? And like filter through the crap, prioritize their, their goals. Then if you have the time, right? Like so if someone comes to you like, hey, I want to do, you know, I want to lose a little bit of weight. I want to put on a bit of muscle. Um, I would like to get a little bit stronger. It's like, can you prioritize those for me? Like, which one do you want? Do you want to get stronger first? Or like, do you want to put on muscle? Not that any of these are going to be mutually exclusive, but if you could like parse these out in your mind, what you prefer, and you also come to me and be like, I don't, I just want to, I want this to be a lifestyle moving forward. And I can train for an hour and a half, five to six days a week. Like, oh, okay. Now some my, this opens up my lens of exercise selection, right? Like this aperture is wide open and I can allow for some of these. Oh yeah, yeah, no, like I saw, I saw this on Instagram. It's like, okay, yeah, it's like a, a, an interesting bicep curl variation. We have enough time and you have an endless amount of runway where we can incorporate this, where it's like, I got a bodybuilding show in six weeks and I'm you know 18% body fat. Hey, like I saw this thing on in the internet about what I'm going to go intermittent fasting. It's like, no, you're not. 
No, you're not. Are you fucking what? Are you dumb? Like you have eight weeks to get in shape to go on stage and you want to eat like Terry Crews for like get the fuck out of here. Like it's just not gonna work. Right? Where if, if someone comes to like, hey, like, you know, I've been watching this thing on intermittent fasting and I just have these general goals of like getting a bit stronger, getting in a little bit better shape. It's like, okay, hey, this open sort of aperture allows us to start to filter in some of these things in the peripheral. And I think looking at it that way will allow you because like if someone has very strict goals and a tight time constraint, their the enjoyment around their training is like, I don't want to say not paramount. But they should be aware that their training is linked to the enjoyment of fulfilling that end goal. Right. Where if the end goal is kind of nebulous, still try and clarify and make some micro goals. Like, you know, let's try and get you down five pounds this month. Okay, like that's, that's not hard, right? But at least it's something that it's, it's actionable, right? It keeps accountability high. But if someone's, you know, if someone's really driving for an end goal, it's like, hey, I want to do this. It's like, wait, because uh, you told me you wanted to win this bodybuilding show in six weeks. So which one is it? Do you want to do a dragon boat race or do you want to win the bodybuilding show? Because you're going to have to make a choice. But if, the, you know, the guy is like sort of this nebulous goal, whatever, and it's like, oh, I got a dragon. Boat. Okay, sweet, man. All right, we'll just like adjust your cardio on these days and, you know, we might like ease off uh, some of the weights. We'll do some, you know, body weight stuff. Uh, early next week all good and then we'll we'll get back on like sort of the general program after that don't want to tax you too much going into it you'll be taxed coming out of it probably pretty sore you know we'll maybe maybe take monday's session off like these are just subtle permutations you make as you go through the ebbs and flows of continuous programming with people and most people like look yeah life's gonna periodize for them but like having a plan i don't know how many times in the last week i've said this to people because like nothing ever goes according to plan however the more you plan, you actually get really good at planning so that when stuff doesn't go according to plan and you're left sitting there with your fucking dick in your hand, you're like, oh, I need to make a new plan really quick. It's like, thank God for me because I've made a zillion fucking plans that never came to fruition and I've been in a zillion situations where I need to come up with a new solution really quickly, but I'm so good at the process of planning that I can come up with a very good plan very quickly that will still push towards my end goal where like a lot of people can look at this and like look at how messy humans are and like humans are so messy not like like sloppy like not clean but like i don't know man i had one okay i had a patient once and i'm not going to name names but this is so close that like someone's going to know if they hear it this lady was married to a guy for 30 years. She came home and he was getting done by the neighbor who was also a guy. <laughs> oh, dude. What a fucking mess. <laughs> right? What do you do? It's like you're not going hitting back and buys later. There's no way in hell you're going and be like, well, today's back and buys day. It's like, no, today's the day you found out your husband was gay after 30 years. Like, Today is not a back and buys day. You know what? Let me Cole's notes this for you. Tomorrow's not a leg day either, right? Like that's just not. So it's like, but you have to be able to. Like if I've, if you program for so many people, it's like, wow, that is a crazy stress. What do you do? It's like, well, we have this plan, but I've had a million plans. And basically 999,999 of those plans didn't work out. So guess what? I have another 990,999 plans left, right? So I've done this, uh, I don't know, almost 2 million times, if my math is correct. So it's like, what's another plan based off this like screwball of like, oh, fuck, that's a, that's a new one. But it's like, it's just another plan. And I think a lot of clients get so demystified with how messy people can be. And like, oh, a client was 15 minutes late. It's like, okay, all right. Well, like just you cut off the last exercise, right? And then maybe if it's like some core thing, they do it at home or they, they you give it to them to do. And while you're training your next client, they're doing their core work. Like, look, I'm keeping eyes on you. You were fucking late. I want you on that mat doing X, Y, and Z. And then you get the fuck out of here, right? It's not that hard, but it's, the ability to like kind of roll with these punches. A lot of people just throw their hands in the air and be like, screw it, man. Like, yeah, how do you feel today? We're going to do it intuitively. It's like, well, that never fucking works, right? Because even if you if you program enough times, your intuition gets sharper because and that's what it becomes. Like you can do this as a bodily function if you've wrote, wrote it down, you know, starting with like Monday's chest triceps, Tuesday's back biceps, Thursday's legs or whatever. But it, if, unless you do that, I almost think of it like 
you know, the way you approach nutrition is like, you can probably look at something and be like, yeah, it's probably six ounces, right? That's probably X number of calories. Every now and then you go, I'm going to weigh this. I'm going to weigh this and I'm going to really tighten it up. So it's like, okay, I was probably under eating on protein, overeating on carbs. I'm watching my weight fluctuate now that I'm hitting those marks directly. And then after that, you're probably like, I don't need the scale anymore. And then you start to drift a little bit, maybe six months down the line, you do it again. Like you calibrate. And I think a lot of people, the longer you do it, they lose that calibration tool. And then all of a sudden their intuition is just, it's just pulling shit out of their ass. It's like, hold on, like go back to the drawing board, man. Like actually put pen to paper on this. And that's one thing I know you do with programming that I love and I still do it is like literally like pen to paper. Oh yeah, dude. It's the best. Even, everything digital starts with a pen and a pad. Yeah. Yeah. That's how my brain works. And I think something uh, important to mention what you're talking about, and it, it's something that's always been assumed for me in my programming. That's why I can say, all right, Monday is snatch, Tuesday is jerk, Wednesday is clean, is it's assumed that I want to get better, mm. right? Progress is assumed in my mind, not everyone's mind. Some people just want to come to the gym and talk to someone that will they're paying to listen to them for an hour. So, so the thing about progress is things have to get harder. You have to be challenged to adapt and get better, right? That's the principle of progressive overload, right? If I squat, you know, 60 kilos every day, I'm probably not going to get any better at squatting, right? Maybe my technique will improve. Maybe, you know, over time my squat will look better, but I'm not going to get any stronger doing the same squat workout every single week. It has to get progressively harder for me to get better. So I think that's something that, that anyone who's listening to this podcast, hopefully it's assumed that progress needs to happen and things need to get harder and people need to be progressively challenged to get better over time. But I think that's something that needs to be communicated to people that don't have that mindset, right? And that can be a weird conversation that we have to do this uncomfortable, hard thing that's going to hurt and you're not going to feel good for a couple of days if you want to get better. What's your number? Like for me, it's 500. Like when I squat 500 pounds, yeah. even on my best days, it's still heavy. Like I've <laughs> squatted 750. And the day, that day when I squatted 500 pounds, I was like, fuck, <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no way another 250 is going on this bar. Yeah. Like, like I could, and I could do 500 for, I don't know, like probably not now, but there's a point where 500 for 10 reps was like, okay, yeah, no problem. Damn. That's and it was just like, but it was a problem when I had it on my back. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck am I going to do this nine more times? That was terrible. Yeah. And then I just did it. And I was like, oh, I guess that's what getting stronger is. It's like. It's literally just like life. It's like, well, this sucks, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah, and I, I get, it, it is as simple as just throwing yourself back into the fire. And it's a lot of people, I don't know, it, it, when things get hard. And you see it in lesser exercises. Like Killian and I talked about this in an episode that went out about calibrating intensity. Something that I would do with gem pop clients is I would just dog them on a fucking spin bike or a, a salt bike for like 10 minutes. Like, yeah, you feel that? Like how you can't breathe and like you kind of taste blood in the back of your mouth and like your legs really hurt and you don't want to stand because you don't think you can. It's like, all right, <laughs> that's a 10, right? Just like every now and then you like, you know, you're in your mind, you're looking at your ribeye going, that's six ounces. Like, motherfucker, that's like 12 ounces. Like, don't, don't, don't <laughs> lie to yourself. And then you put it, <laughs> you, know, you put it on the scale and you're like, oh, I'm recalibrating. Oh, fuck. All right. I guess I'm not eating. I guess I wasn't eating 12 or six ounces of ribeye. I was eating 18 ounces of ribeye. That's like a bajillion calories. It's the same thing with like gen pop people, like something low skill, high output, like an assault bike where it's like, let's learn what pain is first and learn that you can tolerate it and learn that it won't kill you. Right. And then know that tomorrow it can be more painful and you still won't die. Right. So it's like, I think there's such a value and obviously explaining this process because you don't just want to be like, you know, some Jocko willing, like one more bitch, like on your first day. But it's like, this is what this is, right? Like this is not, this single bout isn't going to improve your cardio. You're not going to be in better shape, but you're really going to have access to the single most important calibration tool of your entire training. And guess what? You lose it. Right, just like just like you with the ribeye getting a little bit generous, six turns into eight, turns into twelve, turns into eighteen. It's like you get a little bit soft, right? Like I've I've literally like had to 
the number of times in a set I did, I back squatted this morning. The number of times in a set that I call myself a bitch is, is almost, there's no time for anything else. Like, God, you're such a bitch. And it's like, whatever, positive self-talk, take it. That's for weak people. Right. But it's like in the, in the trenches of training, and I don't like necessarily like that word, but while you're training, it's like, look, it's going to suck. It's going to, we know this going in and it's like that, it's what gets me through some days is just like this, yeah, it's heavy and you're going to go to a call later with someone and that's going to suck and you're going to do it and you're going to drive home and some fucking guy's going to cut you off and you're not going to kill them with the hammer in your door and then you're going to go home and you're, some lady's going to get up your tree about not wearing a mask and you're not going to punch her in the grill and it's just like, you just, you yeah, do it. It's about this fucking life. And that honestly, for me, it's like, that's what training has given me is like, it is such a proxy for life. It's just like, wow, it's heavy and it's on my back and it sucks. And it's like, well, guess what? Uh, tomorrow it's going to be heavier. So you can either uh, suck, start a shotgun or you can just fucking shut up. And it's like, all right, I guess shut up is my only option. And then that's how, and that's how the story goes. But yeah, exercise programming. I think it, there's a way more to it in some ways. And it's in the ways that people don't consider like hey, calibrate for pain understand what actual progress is Pro progress is the root of progressive overload like spell spell legendary without leg day spell progressive overload without progress right like these things are intangibly linked so i, I think a lot of people spend time focusing on the easy things right and in, the, in that in a way over complicates it where it's like look if you focus on like the really important shit and you identify what that is and you can relay the why these things are important to your clients, exercise programming becomes a bodily function. Like, and obviously just like anything, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. But it's always, I think, recalibrate. Every now and then, do I do it to myself, write my, write my what I've done in the last week and going like, wait a minute, what the fuck? This <laughs> program makes no sense. Like even down to the basics of like, I train chest and biceps on Monday, so I don't train shoulders on Tuesday. Right. I look at my program I'm like, oh, I trained like legs three days in a row last week. <laughs> like what the fuck am I doing? Right? And it's like, oh, okay, like, you know, use these recalibration tools of like, pain of performance like use these different proxies and just check in every now and then and be like yo am i being a bitch and it's like oh shit i'm being a huge bitch i'm squatting 315 at 260 pounds like what the fuck is wrong with you like you know am i being an idiot i look at my program like i trained legs three days straight last week i'm also being an idiot it's like well don't be a bitch and don't be an idiot that's exercise programming wow that was so insightful i think so because i think with people who you know, it's not one of these, like, I don't know who needs to hear this thing. It's like, I don't know. I have no idea. But if you're listening and this resonates, you do. You know. <laughs> and it's you. You're either being a bitch or an idiot. Or an idiot. Or both. And a lot of times, let's be serious, it's both. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think if you haven't ever written, and I don't want this to be, like, disparaging or discouraging, but it's like, if you haven't written actually, write it. Yeah. And just start the process of writing programming. Write it for yourself. Write it for your friends. Like, because guess what? In 10 years, you're going to look back and be like, oh, man, I was a dumb bitch. Like, that was really stupid and great. And that means maybe you're a little bit less dumb now, right? And I just, a lot of people are too afraid to start. And they, they call on intuition and all this stuff. But it's like, you know, it, the, the proof's in the pudding. There's only a few filtering criteria that really are going to consolidate your exercise uh, programming process. And then it just becomes almost the art is the in the expediency, right? The art is in like just being able to do it like that. Right? You don't need to take any time. You know, the, the situations are going to change, right? Everything's always going to go wrong. That old Murphy's Law thing. But how can you and how quickly can you come up with a new plan? Yeah. Love it. <sighs> Londy, we did it, man. We did it. <laughs> Rock on, party on. All right, guys. Well, uh, all the time we have for today, uh, head on over to iTunes, Spotify. So subscribe is something that we never do. Yeah. Subscribe to the podcast. Go into the app and hit the button that says subscribe. So females talking about being sluts on podcasts and people talking about keto don't rank higher than us on iTunes. <laughs> Nothing drives me nuts like watching the top 50 list and just being like, oh, this is just soft core. Okay, this is, this is AMSR, or whatever the ASMR, whatever the fuck that bullshit is. Like, I don't want to be... Uh, if some old dude... 
is like on some paleo bullshit and he's ahead of us. Like that's on you guys for not subscribing. So if you haven't subscribed, go on Spotify, iTunes, hit the subscribe button. Um, and if not, then just don't listen at this point. <laughs> just don't give us hope. Take it um, or leave it. Take it or leave it. Dumb bitches. Uh, <laughs> all right. At London Jack Productions, at Red White and Jordan, at RX Radio. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Thanks, guys.